mind. Well, thank you for joining us this morning for our workshop on building a diverse pipeline of gift planners. We have with us a mix today of some development professionals and some um, professional advisors with us. So welcome everyone. For those that don't know me, I'm Leslie Banus, Director of Programs here at the Community Foundation. And I have the pleasure of introducing our speakers today. We have been working with them, um, especially with Dean, for a while now to get this plan to bring this workshop to our community. So thank you both for being with us. Um, so we're going to introduce um, Deanne Yuen. Did I say that correctly? We, we practice. Thank you. So Deanne is a <laughs> professor of philanthropy at the American College of Financial Services. Um, she's very versed in family and global philanthropy and has years of experience as a philanthropic consultant, gift planner, and wealth advisor. So thank you for joining us today. We also have with us um, Karee Jackson-Lewis. She is the um, founder and principal of the California Philanthropic Consulting. She is an expert in nonprofit tax and uh, philanthropy strategies and a seasoned trust and estate planning attorney with more than 20 years experience in estate tax and charitable giving. So welcome, and I'm gonna pass it over to them. And uh, again, today, if you have any questions, feel free to um, interrupt. We're gonna keep it casual. You can um, also use the chat button and message us in the chat or message one of our speakers um, to, to get your questions going. So I'm gonna go ahead and pass it over. So thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having us. We're so pleased to be here this morning. And we wanted to say thank you so much for taking this time out to look at this very important and really interesting presentation. Uh, Deanne and I work very closely. I'm also a co-moderator of, of one of the Advisors of Color cohorts for the Chartered Advisor and Philanthropy Program at the American College of Financial Services or the CAP program. And so this is something that we have been talking about and working with for a while. So it's it's indeed my pleasure to be here with Professor Deanne uh, to talk about this with you. Uh, and the way that we would like to go through this presentation is to, uh, we'll talk about some of the data and the statistics surround, surrounding, surrounding uh, the talent pipeline in gift planning and plan giving. And then we'll discuss some of the data that we brought up to, to further illustrate and extend the learning. Uh, so first, here's the agenda. So we'll talk about the changing demographics of our donors. We know here in the United States, um, the phrase is called the browning of the US. And so in that, we mean that our donors and our uh, fellow countrymen are not just sort of the folks who came over on the Mayflower, but of course, um, Native American, Latinx, African American, um, Asian American. Uh, we have quite a, a few changes going on uh, here in the United States. And we want to make sure that our gift planners are I have the cultural competency to speak to potential donors and to speak to and learn about the cultures of our donors in order to be most effective to bring donors to our nonprofit organizations to advise potential donors in their wealth planning, their state planning, tax gift and income planning, and also to bring them closer to our nonprofits so our nonprofits can better serve them. Next, we'll talk about challenges faced by advisors and gift planners in looking at the way that we work together in these organizations. As we begin, I think in the last, I'll say about 18 months or so, we know that there are challenges here in the US in respect of issues of race and class and gender, uh, and we are an um, gender identity. And we want to ensure that we are understanding what those challenges are because we can't face them until we understand what they are. And then we'll look at some of the ways that advisors and gift planners can negotiate these issues for themselves, their families, everywhere that we live, work and play. Uh, number three, we're going to talk about promoting diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so diversity, of course, if you break that down, I know that in our world, we deal with acronyms like GRATS and CRUTS and CGAs and things like that. But to spell it out, we'd like to make sure that we're talking to you 
and that we're all on the same page and level setting about the definitions of these words. So when we talk about diversity, we're talking about people who are diverse in their backgrounds, their cultures, their class. We're talking about all types of geographical diversity as well. We're talking about people who are from every walk of life. And we know, and the research shows, and of course, McKinsey has many, many studies on this, organizations that are more diverse and more successful. And so we know that when we're talking about diversity, we're talking about diversity of neurodiversity, all types of diversity. When we talk about equity, we are talking about a fairness and access and opportunity. Uh, and when we talk about inclusion, inclusion is an outcome, right? So inclusion means that there is a place and there's a space for everyone to have their needs and concerns heard and held and addressed in an organization. And then at the end of that process becomes inclusion. And the last thing that we'll do is provide resources for you all to do further learning and further study to bring back the learnings that you'll uh, uh, take away from this presentation and to extend your learning and further scaffold your understanding about the issues that we face and the power that you have to move from awareness to action in the organizations in which you work. And so Deanne, I think we can go to the next slide. Okay, great. Um, so, so just so you know, it would be great to keep you really informal. And anytime again, you have questions or comments, please drop it in chat. Um, I'm so sorry, I can't see the raised hand function right now. Um, and so I am the, the total data geek here, so I will be sharing the data. And then Curry's <laughs> gonna talk about real lived experiences, all right? So, um, and, and we're gonna go back and forth a little bit. Um, I thought we would start with just the changing don donor graphics, um, following what Curry was saying about, you know, how America is just, the demographics are changing. Um, and I thought this was fascinating when I came across this uh, research. Um, it's basically saying that we are still working with donors as if we've been doing this since 1990, right? Mm -hmm. So why are we not having um, the Black, the Asian, the Latino representation in our donor demographics? And there's two reasons. One, you could assume that's because they don't give, right? So, or maybe it's because they're not being asked. Um, they're not being brought to the table. And I have to believe it's got to be the second reason, because we've talked to a lot of uh, communities of color, and most of them are basically saying we're quite insulated, we give within our own community, but it's really difficult to break into the mainstream community. So, Curry, as a consultant, are you also seeing this too? One of the things I find really fascinating about this is that when you, it's interesting that you, you look at the donor demographics and you say, okay, so we've got lots of folks in our worlds, right? In our communities and our colleges, where we work, everywhere we go, but why are we not being asked? And uh, I have a story where uh, one donor uh, was sort of being courted, right? Being courted by a nonprofit. And, you know, this is a donor. If you do your donor research, if you have your prospect research, your well screenings, all of those things, you know that this donor had been giving to nonprofits, had lots of real estate, business owner. You know, she took him to lunch and she asked him for, you know, $500, which is amazing, right? Because he was sort of gearing up for a $25,000 ask, which is similar to what he had been giving other nonprofits in that field. And so it, it's, it's fascinating to think that uh, it may not only just be uh, the fact that folks don't ask that's an issue, but also what is that barrier that's keeping uh, donor um, relations officers or development officers, what's the barrier keeping people from asking? And in some of the research I've done, in addition to this, this Blackboard report, which is really quite striking, some of the research I've done for the uh, for my um, certified specialist in plan giving designation, uh, as part of my practicum, we talked about changing donor graphics and how do you appeal to uh, donors of color. And one of the issues that we, we did talk about was saying that there is a, a belief somehow that people of color don't have money. Which is a is which is odd, right? If you think about 
uh, or if you know anything about marketing here in the United States, or if you know anything about your consumers in the United States, um, certainly there is money. It's just not being given to you, right? And why is that? And so I do think that it is a matter of ensuring that we are not only uh, making that ask, right, but that we're making that ask to uh, uh, donors who perhaps have been overlooked traditionally in your organization. Uh, and I think that's something that uh, don't that nonprofits will have to deal with moving forward. Great, and, and you know the the sad part. Move the screen for us. The sad part about this is there's not a whole lot of research right. on donors of color. And so um, a couple, see, about four or five years ago, the Gates Foundation, Paul Ogden, and a few folks came together and supported Holly Lee and Ashindi Ash Maxson's project called Donors of Color. And you should, I encourage you to go on the website um, and download this research called The Apparitional Donor. Right. And they named right. it The Apparitional Donor because they're apparitions, right? You don't see them. <laughs> Um, and the, Holly was amazing. She called on 128 high net worth and ultra high net worth donors of color, sat in their living rooms and basically asked them all sorts of questions. Mm -hmm. um, and here's some of the highlights. I'm going to go through this really quick. Um, you're going to get the um, PowerPoint so you could dig in a little bit more, but definitely encourage you to take a look at their reports. Um, so, you know, we have what, approximately 1.3 million, right? With a million more liquid assets. Um, but what I found surprising is if you take out the like million dollar gifts and the lower end gifts, the people she spoke to, the average gift was about $180,000. That's the annual giving, right? And 78% are wealth earners and wealth creators. Um, and then we also know that, you know, giving amongst the family and extended family and friends is also kind of their way of thinking that this is how we give. Um, but what was amazing from all this you know, conversation was because most of these folks are kind of the first of the first in their generation to start a business, to go to college, you know, to do really well, um, they're kind of seen as the ATM for their family. And so when you do estate planning or when you think, you know, talked about financial planning or even gifting, you have to understand that it's not just their immediate family that they take care of. It's not the grandparents and parents. It's not the kids, but it's also you got to go wide. Right. 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 Um, right. Multi layers. And most of them have experienced some sort of racism, discrimination and bias. And that, you know, when they start talking about these stories, this is where the true kind of what do you want to make right? What is your philanthropic giving look like? This is where they really come back to. Um, and then finally, the last one was, I thought this is fascinating. A lot of the donor or folks asked Holly, Holly, can you recommend an Asian American estate planner? Can you recommend a philanthropy advisor who's right. you know, Asian American? And that surprised Holly and her researchers a lot. They're basically looking for advisors of color and mm -hmm. they can't find them. So mm -hmm. I'll stop there, Kari. What do you think? I mean, are they spot on or is this what you're seeing also in your work? I, I do, I do think it's spot on. And and you know, every time I look at these slides, I, I don't know why I'm surprised every time. And I guess it's because I think we know as folks who work in philanthropy, how, how small and incestuous it is, right? <laughs> I think we know, if you don't know someone, you know someone who knows that person, right? We are all six degrees of Kevin Bacon in this field, right? So uh, if you say Russell James, everybody says, oh, Russell James, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> we, we all know um, people in the field. So this network, this idea of folks being outside this network so it feels a little bit foreign in some ways. But, you know, as, a, as an African-American female, I think about who I give to and why and when I started giving differently. And certainly as a young person, uh, you know, my mom, my family, we all gave to our church, we gave to our universities, um, we gave to uh, organizations that have represented the interests of African American people, so the Urban League, the NAACP, um, you know, other organizations like that. And so you can see how the, the vision that or the research that comes back saying that 
these particular issues are of concern. And so we give to these small circles. You can see that that's, in my lived experience, that's quite true. But again, as you go further and you start expanding your networks, and we have to use this word intentional, and I think we'll use this word a lot during this uh, discussion. If you're really intentional about expanding your network, you can find other organizations um, that you can trust. And so I think the intentionality and the word trust are also going to come up because you can only move as fast as the speed of trust with these donors. The donors have to trust you and your nonprofit, and they have to know that you represent their interests. And if they don't see, or, or if I don't see board members that look like me or volunteers that look like me, or even um, the, the staff, nobody looks like me, then I'm wondering, do you really represent my interests? I'm not really sure, right? You, you appear to do good work, but who is feeding back your information? How do I know that you're making an impact if you're not integrating, I suppose, literally, if you're not integrating people of color within your work? So that network within philanthropy is not extending to the donors. And so then the donors are looking for professionals to manage their assets and to provide this, this advice and to engage in estate planning, but it's really tough to find folks that look like us. And we need to understand and know and consider what are the barriers to participation for people of color and, and what can we do to, to remove those barriers? And, you know, aside from if, if because there's not a whole lot of Asian American estate planners and all that, and I'll get to the numbers. Right. What I'm encouraging folks to do, all the advisors, is to be a little bit open, learn about the issues that communities of color is faced, right? Because what we also want to encourage is um, kind of the mainstream advisors to also work with communities of color. And the way right. to do that, it used to be cultural competency that we would right. talk about. Right. But cultural competency is really working with one type of culture I think the new term um, uh, the Harvard professor is talking about now is cultural dexterity, mm, which I, mm. found, I found was fascinating digging mm. into his research. So because of the changing demographics and the multi-generations that we're working with now, I think being fluent in cultural dexterity, right? right I think right, it's the key right. for everybody. Um, and then, you know, you all know the three T's, like time, talent, and treasure. Right. Um, but I've learned in the last year, there's three more T's. Mm -hmm. um, and that's ties, testimony, and truths. Mm -hmm. And in communities of color, the ties and the testimony are so, so important. Mm -hmm. And now because of all that's been happening, we also have to look at ourselves in the mirror and say, are we really reflecting, right, what we're trying to do? So the truth has mm -hmm. been added recently. Um, so for all the fundraisers in the room, <laughs> so because, I, you know, I love numbers. Um, mm -hmm. The Association of Fundraising Professionals did a survey um, and they have about 31,000 fundraisers, all the way from your annual gifts to the major gifts, right, um, mm -hmm. that do this work. And they basically said less than 10% are professionals of color. Um, and AADO, which is the African-American Development Officers Group, um, mm -hmm. also confirms this as well. Um, and then, this was fascinating to me. Um, charitable gift planners, um, uh, or the National Association of Charitable Gift Planners, that, that's their full name. They do this every, every other year. They send out a survey to 8,000 of their members. These are you know, members of the plan giving councils, right, that right. you see. Um, and this is so, so interesting. If you walk into a room, imagine like 490 people in this room, only 32 of them are people of color. So, and if you break, um, oh, so sorry, this one is about age. We're all getting old, so you don't need to know that. We all know that. <laughs> I think 30% of us are 60 and, well, not us yet, but 30% of us are uh, 60 and older. So we know the profession is changing. But this mm -hmm. one was fascinating to me about the, the, um, the racial piece. Um, eight of them are Asian. Right. Seven of them are African-American. I mean, it's, the numbers are horrible. So that's why when you talk to a lot of um, folks in our profession, they'll say, we walk in the room, we're always the only one. Right. Right? It's true. And I, and I will say that um, one of the things that is really fascinating about this study, besides the fact that it's kind of shocking um, and, and thinking about walking into that room is that I think seeing it on paper 
it's really shocking, but walking into that room is never shocking because that's basically what we do most of the time. And I will say that as an estate planning attorney, there are not a lot of African-American estate planning attorneys. And so uh, you, you sort of get used to being maybe the one and only, but it is tough. Um, and I think as you uh, take the time and, and move through your work over the years, you, uh, you have to create that circle for yourself and you have to create your networks. And that's why you'll see organizations like the ones that uh, were up a little earlier in the slides, the African-American Development Office Association and the Women of Color and Fundraising and Philanthropy. There's also the Rooted Collective. There's also F3, Fabulous Female Fundraisers. You know, there are these, these groups that work together to ensure that we are uh, becoming better represented uh, in the world of philanthropy and that we're encouraging uh, more folks to come into the gift planning profession. But that's on one side of the ledger. That's sort of like the expense side. The income side is what is traditional philanthropy doing to be more welcoming and to remove barriers? Um, it, it is a, uh, a very common scene, I think, uh, in, in many nonprofit organizations where you have some frontline people who are people of color. And if you go up that triangle, you see at the very top is a white man. And in between, you'll see some Latinx people and, and mainly white women, um, but then you'll have uh, people of color at the bottom. And so what we need to do is figure out how do, how do we take this triangle, shake it up in our magic ball, right? And say, what we need to be successful is to have that rich diversity to make sure that our, our profession reflects the, the diversity of the world around us. And so it, it's interesting and, and again, shocking looking at this, the, this debt data, but I think that, again, we have to understand and know what these challenges are in order to face them. Okay. And, and then uh, diversity is more than, right, just, just the right. race and ethnic um, pieces of it. There's also diversity in LGBT communities as well. Um, and this, this was not a shock for me, but actually to see a report on it was again, um, shocking. Um, we have a lot of people, LGBTQs, who actually are still very quiet. They're still afraid to share their um, gender preferences with even their colleagues and the people they work with, right? And their peers. Um, so this report came out uh, about a year ago um, and came out in 2018. And then they actually did another report on top of it to check and make sure the numbers um, were still uh, relatively the same. And unfortunately it was. Um, so we still have a lot to do, not just with the racial and ethnic piece, but also with gender as well in our work. And I think this is really telling. I mean, so there's this process at work that's called covering. And so covering is when you are uh, suppressing a component of your identity in order to fit in at work. And people of color do it so that they are not um, emphasizing or really showing a part of their life that would make them different from the people that are around them. And I think this also happens in the LGBTQIA2 spirit plus community where uh, folks are not able to fully act, be fully actualized at work and to be full persons at work. And the research shows that that covering activity is exhausting. It's emotionally exhausting. And what it does is it takes away from your, or it can take away from your effectiveness such that you actually do have to work harder and longer to, to be the as effective as you would like to be because you're also spending your energy engaging in this covering. There's also research, research and we'll get to this later on, about how uh, the, the act of dealing with micro Aggressions has a similar effect. And that's also partly uh, why I think people actually like working from home, right? Right. Especially Absolutely. Women of color do not want to go back in the office right. <laughs> in general because they don't want to deal with the microaggressions. Right, right. So, um, so and, and then, of course, we also have the disability piece as well, right? Um, and this is really sad. I think most nonprofit organizations and most employers do not address this quite well. And we, we found that one in five people in the US has a disability. 
right? And you're talking about board representation. I mean, it's not even there in most of these organizations. I think that's right. And, and it's, and it's, you know, we don't want to, um, to take away from the, the, the many nonprofits that deal with disability, uh, the respectability survey that, that, um, that the data that we're um, p- putting out here, um, respectability is a wonderful organization. And I think they do a really good job in bringing to light some of the issues affecting folks with a disability. Um, you know, I'm blind in my right eye. And I think that it would be useful if people had uh, more, uh, not only useful, but it's really imperative, right? To ensure that folks are able to be productive, to, to have things like when you're having events, you know, is, is are, are your events conducive to the participation of people with disabilities? Uh, some events, you know, some of these larger events need to have closed captioning. There should at least be a transcript. Do you have a ramp at, uh, you know, and most public buildings and most buildings do have some kind of Americans with Disabilities Act type of accommodations. But, you know, do they really need to be even accommodations? Shouldn't it be just something that everybody has? Right. So we're really what we're looking to do is to ensure that when we talk about diversity, we're talking about all different types of abilities and backgrounds and cultures and that we're we're doing what we need to do to be inclusive. And remember, inclusive is the result. Right. And so we're not talking just about the the structure, how we get through there, but also the result. So we have to have inclusivity from the beginning and it needs to be integrated through all of the work that's being done at that nonprofit, including who your vendors are, who manages the money, who caters your events. Um, and then at the very end, we get inclusivity. Speaking of inclusivity, we should not, you know, forget the for-profit folks, right? Yep, that's right. Absolutely. <laughs> so, so for those estate planners in the room, um, this, this was fascinating. Uh, uh, the American Bar Association also did a study, um, but I found uh, this one CPS um, information the most uh, recent. I don't think this is surprising. I mean, you and I went to law school. We know <laughs> we've been estate planning attorneys. We see this. Yeah. Um yeah, I don't know how I react to this. Except, yes. <laughs> <laughs> right. It is what it is. And I know that when I first started working, my, my first estate, my first job as a lawyer was at Wilkie Farr and Gallagher. Uh, and that's a big law firm and, uh, and in New York. And so uh, in estate planning, you know, it's very much uh, sort of an old school, old money, New York people. Right. And so there was a, um, and, and a woman that we had at Wilkie Farr who was the doyen, right, of New York society. And so if you were working estate planning, you would go into her office, beautifully decorated with, you know, very expensive portraits and beautiful furniture. And you would have tea in her office with her Limoges tea. And you would kiss the ring, right? Because you would learn that she's the person who would introduce you to the folks whose estates you'd be planning. Um, and it very much speaks to the um, sort of the network issue that we talked about earlier. Who do you know, right? And so if estate planners must know very, very wealthy people in one demographic, it might be that you start out with the people that they know, right? And the people that they know are all white. And then the people that they know are all white. And so you don't get the diversity uh, in estate planners because the, the those people are choosing people who look like them. And so in order to ensure that we're, we're getting a more diverse um, pipeline of people in estate planning, one, we should be doing estate planning for more uh, people of color. And then we should also be encouraging more people of color to become estate planners and philanthropic consultants. Yeah, I, I did a presentation with Marty Shankman on this issue of diversity. Oh, yeah. And we, we had a one hour presentation and our slides ended up being over like 200 slides. Oh, Thanks, Louise. <laughs> and, well, Marty likes that though. <laughs> but it, it was just amazing. As we started digging into the concept of diversity, there was yeah, in estate planning, you also have to worry about religious backgrounds, right? Right, right, um, right And then right. you also have to, you know, all the different types of investments that are allowed or not allowed. Right, right. It's a gifting 
that are allowed within the family. Right. Um, so it was, it was just amazing how diverse and just just um, the whole estate planning profession is. Unfortunately, we still use the same intake form, right? right? Right. And I remember talking to one family, like, okay, there's only six spaces for like family <laughs> members. I need at least 25, right? right? So again, it's just like thinking through your process, you know, are you not attracting these types of clients because of your systems and process as mm-hmm. well? Um, and the questions that you are asking. So um, okay. this is easy for me to talk about because I work at the American College of Financial Services and I can tell you these numbers are so accurate. It's so <laughs> embarrassing. <laughs> and unfortunately, the financial sector is not diverse at all. Um, it's still 85% white. Um, we are trying to change that. And the reason I we see is um, you have... Uh, advisors of color hitting the middle management level. And once they get into middle management, if they cannot move up to a senior uh, vice president or getting into the C-suite level, they end up leaving, right? And you will see this also reflected in the nonprofit sector as well. So what was surprising for me to find out was in the financial sector, if women of color hit that middle management piece, they can't move up, they leave, they start their own business whether it's in the financial sector or other types of businesses, being an entrepreneur, or they end up leading nonprofits that they start. Um, so what do you think? Are you seeing this also, Gary? What, I, what I'm seeing now, of course, we know we're in the middle of the great resignation, right? And so this also applies to the nonprofit world. And I don't know if you've been on LinkedIn lately, but there are a lot of people looking for development offers and fundraisers now. And I think part of that is because there are people who have during this this time of COVID and remote working, taken a look at the, the environment that they've been working in, Uh, They're looking at the sacrifices that are being made. They're looking at their potential for uh, uh, moving up, right, for advancement uh, and also saying, you know, what type of work do I want to do? What speaks to my heart now? And so we are looking at uh, a situation where some people are able to say, I'm going to make changes in my world because I know what's important to me. I know that I need to be either closer to my family or I want to do work with dignity. I don't feel like I'm respected. Uh, I am dealing with all of the aggressions of trying to make myself be, uh, you know, I am a square peg in a round hole in some of these nonprofits. Uh, I'm not getting ahead. Um, the the metrics aren't aren't suited for my um, for the work that I do, even though I'm bringing in the money and and uh, up, uplifting and showing the impact of the nonprofit. There's something I'm told that I don't that I'm just not the right fit, right? So we know folks like Crystal Cherry who started the Board Pro. Uh, we know some other. Um, African-American women who have gone off to start their own business. I mean, for myself, I started California Philanthropic Consulting because after um, after spending time in estate planning and in the nonprofit world, I wanted to be able to use my estate planning skills to help nonprofits. And, and I wanted to be able to build that bridge. And so here I am pulling myself again out of the nonprofit world, even though I really do love nonprofits. Um, But I wanted to be able to make sure that I could use my estate planning skills to not only help nonprofits that I work with, but to help BIPOC-led and BIPOC-serving nonprofits, right? Because we know that these smaller nonprofits don't have these diverse revenue streams. They don't have the endowments that they need to get through things like COVID when they weren't having galas and they weren't having volunteer opportunities um, and activities. Uh, the workplace giving wasn't coming through like it was because everybody was home and these companies are taking PPP loans. So we, so my goal for CPC was to ensure that we're working with these smaller nonprofits to help them set up these plan giving and legacy society programs. And this is my way of stepping out of the sector to say, I'm not getting what I need from the organization I work with. And again, I mean, I will say anecdotally to myself, it, it is tough. Um, you know, dealing with the microaggressions and and uh, and weird racist type of stereotypes that come in and out. Um, and so 
And so you do spend your time saying, where are the hits going to come from now? Um, But in my own business, I'm very well aware of the work that I do and the people that I that I work with and who I'm partnering with. And it it definitely is a very different uh, set of circumstances. So I do understand the 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 uh, the impetus. Uh, I very well understand the impetus to start one's own business, to remove yourself from an environment that's not welcoming. And and it's also for females, too, even in the professions, right, Uh, especially the financial sector, it's it's very male dominated. And so for females, especially when you hit, you know, the, the childbearing age and the family and starting all that. It's just, it just doesn't work. And so they also end up leaving as well. So I think that is a huge issue we need to address, especially if you look at who is holding wealth in the next couple of years, right? It is female. Absolutely. Um, and I got to tell you guys, I'm sorry, the men die first, right? <laughs> really? I'm sorry, you know, the men die first. And so the women end up with that wealth. And there is research that shows that, uh, and and I don't know, I mean, like I said, I mentioned mentioned Russell James before, um, you know, that shows that if you are the nonprofit that works with that female for the last three years of her life, you're the one that gets the money, right? Don't leave her aside because the husband has died. Don't think that she's not thinking about Um, or she doesn't know what she wants to do with that money. She does. Um, And so it's really important to ensure that you have that mindset of cultivating and stewarding these older donors, because that donor could have given you a thousand dollars every year, but in the last five years of their life, if you're not sitting down with them and talking with them, you will not be remembered. So I, I want to go back to go forward and say, so what do we do about this, right? So, right. so I think right. a, a, a few words, um, some new terms I'd like to share. One is um, bamboo ceiling. Right. This is instead of the right. glass ceiling, right. Asian Americans refer this as the bamboo ceiling. We hit the right. bamboo ceiling, mm-hmm. right? So mm-hmm. the, the other term that you're going to start hearing about is the double glass ceiling, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Being female, being Asian American or being female and Black right? Mm, Double mm. glass ceiling. And then there's the triple glass ceiling if you add in the layers of disability or LGBTQ in there. Um, So you see a lot of these new terms, I think, in the news. Well, not new. They've been around, but now they're just being exposed a little bit more. Um, So let's switch to sponsorship and mentorship because how do we address this, right? Right, How do we uplift others and how do we I'm very hesitant about using the word empowerment um, (laughs) as if they don't didn't have power in the first place. Right, right, Um, right. But I I do like the word word of sponsorship and we use it in the nonprofit differently than how we would think about career and talent development. So Curry, do you want to jump into that? I love, I love talking about sponsorship and mentorship. I'm a mentor for a 1L law student at Loyola Law School where I got my tax uh, LLM. Um, and I think mentorship and sponsorship is something that we do sort of maybe in my family, just almost intuitively. So my family is very much an education oriented family. Uh, My great uncle was Benjamin Mays, who was the president of Morehouse College. And he taught Dr. King and many luminaries of the civil rights movement. You know, education is the key. And so as part of our devotion and dedication to education, um, you know, I have a a twin sister and she's, you know, um, undergrad at Fordham and MFA at Yale. I mean, we're just uh, people that really believe in the power of education. And then we actually use that uh, power to um, give a hand up, not a hand out. So if we're looking at sponsorship and mentorship, and we know they're they're very different things, and I think sometimes they do get confused. So I'm so glad that we're uh, talking about this during this presentation. So this intermediated impression management is a very fancy term for saying, I am vouching for this person. This person has done an amazing job on this project and that project. And by the way, I think you should put him or her or them on this new project. Have you, they are spending that time amplifying, boosting, connecting, and defending that person. And they are using their own capital, right? Their own personal capital to bless and amplify someone else. This is a very, very special relationship. And that sponsorship is your network. And I tell this to my kids all the time, your network 
is your net worth. You must, must, must be out there. And Deanne is a consummate connector. You must be out there making sure that if you're that sponsor, you're a person who is taking someone under your wing, as it were, and saying, I believe in you. I believe in your potential. I believe in what you can do for this company and what you can do for our field. And let's do this together. And then on the mentorship side, that's more of what I'm doing, say, for this this first year law student at Loyola. Assistance that a mentor can provide is guidance, advice, feedback on skills and coaching. I would also add um, and this is because this is this is kind of like my other thing that I do is I help students who want to go to law school um, and so that's and who want to go to college as well. So that's kind of my other thing that I do because I just don't have enough to do. Um, and so it really is you have to think about your life and your career like a job. Right. It is your job to think about your life and your career like a job. So that means the first day that you walk into your job, you're looking at who's who in the zoo, what do they do, how can they help you be successful, which helps the company be successful, what's your next step, what, what uh, is your career path. You know, you have to be in control of your uh, impressions, what you look like, self-awareness is key. Um, I used to teach special education, you know, many years ago when we first moved to California. My husband has dragged us all over the world for his job. So when we first moved to California to be close to my children, I was a teaching assistant in special education. And then I became a special education teacher and I worked for the um, uh, emotionally disturbed classroom. So I was the emotionally disturbed teaching assistant. He was the emotionally disturbed teacher. Um, <laughs> but that was that what the class was. But one of the things he always taught was self-awareness. No, whether you are, um, are have autism, schizophrenia, traumatic brain injury, whatever it is, you are in control of your image. You're in control of how people see you. So whether you feel like However you feel internally, you're the person who can walk into a room, get a book from the library and walk out without causing a scene because you know what people expect to see. In the same way for mentorship, you can talk to your uh, to folks who are coming into your uh, nonprofit, whether people of color, women, LGBTQIA, Two-Spirit Plus, uh, folks with a disability, you talk to them about how to be successful in your place of work, what is expected, what is required, and then let them mentor you and say, here's what my culture uh, supports and appreciates. In my culture, for example, as African-American culture, we value teamwork over the tall poppy syndrome, right? We value teamwork. We work together as a team. We're not always looking for someone to be a leader. We like to work as a collective, right? And that being the case, if you're just a team member, you often are overlooked. You're a good team member, but you're not seen as a leader. That's no good, right? So even though it may be intuitive and natural to work as a team, when your mentor says, you've got to be seen, we've got to amplify you, we've got to boost you, then you have to get up and do that. And so if we don't have programs that encourage sponsorship and mentorship for these people of color, for women, for LGBTQIA, Two-Spirit Plus, for folks with disabilities, they're not going to be successful and they'll just drop out of the race. And, and I would say also um, that for mentorship, um, and, and this is very unfortunate because there are not enough people that look like them in their organization. Mm. Most of them actually end up you know, looking for mentors outside the organization, right? Mm. Um, which is mm. quite unfortunate because then it's very difficult then to figure out and navigate internally. That's um, right. so, so that's why if you, if you think of mentorship, you will see other people, you know, saying outside of the organization, but sponsorship has to be within that organization. Or else you cannot, you cannot move up. Um, and just from my experience, all my sponsors and my mentors have been white men. <laughs> so and it, especially you know like coming from like Michigan and Ohio and then even moving to the Bay Area trying to move up and navigate especially the financial sector because I worked at U.S. Trust and then another wealth management firm and it was like you do have to rely on the white male to be your sponsor because they figured it out and you want to learn from them right? <laughs> um, so I, I'm gonna end here Kurt, do you have any other 
comments, maybe we can open up for Q and A because we have a few minutes left. Oh, that's right. The, the rest of the slides are just resources, and we hope you know you the group will take a look at them. And any questions, we are all available to help and assist. Thank you. So Leslie, uh, should we do Q&A or not? Um, yeah, that would be great. I'm going to turn the recording on.